Good morning, everyone. I think it's nine o'clock and it's time to start. Um, my name is Raka Ray and I am the Dean of the, um, the Social Sciences at Berkeley. And I'm also a professor of sociology and South Asian studies. And this morning we're going to be in conversation or rather I'm going to be in conversation with Amita Babeskar, professor of sociology and um, environmental studies at Ashoka University. You can learn more about Professor Baveskar's wonderful work on the sociology and politics of the environment at a link which will soon appear um, in the chat uh, function. So what we're gonna talk about today is COVID at home, gender, class, and the domestic economy. Given the conditions of existence um, called upon by COVID, whether it be called lockdown as in India or sheltering in place as in California, the home has assumed particular significance for it is to this space that we are all confined. For those of us who have jobs and can work from home, the boundaries are between home and work are blurred. These are boundaries that have been really carefully created within the economic system of capitalism to create a separation of home and work and those boundaries are now blurred. And for those of us who no longer have jobs, well, home takes on an entirely different meaning as well. And so we want to talk about the effect of COVID on the place that we call home. But first, let's consider the nature of this space. Home as we know it is not just a place of safety and refuge for us to nurture our families and be nurtured by our families. For many, home is a place of labor paid and unpaid. It is a place of pain and it is a place where inequalities are reproduced and produced. So my co-author Simi Kayum and I a few years ago wrote a book on domestic work in India called Cultures of Servitude. What we observed there was this, that the presence of domestic workers in Indian middle-class families made it possible for the women of those families to achieve modernity. In other words, made it possible for them to go out um, to work, making them therefore modern women. It also did something else. It pushed to the fringe major questions of the gendered division of labor within the middle class household. These questions of the gendered division of labor, who does the laundry, who changes the diapers, who cooks the food, who cleans, these questions of, uh, of, of gender division of labor had really been foundational to second wave feminism here in the US. But these questions did not appear at the forefront of the questions of uh, feminism in, um, of second wave feminism in India because neither the husband nor the wife were really doing much of this. It was being um, done by domestic workers. In other words, middle-class women were able to count on, on class inequality to mitigate gender inequality in the home. We had written then in Cultures of Servitude that the institution of paid domestic work produces not just clean homes and well-fed well -fed children, but it also reproduces class, gender, and caste inequalities within the home. And I say all of this, it's sort of a long introduction, but I say this because during lockdown, most middle-class Indians have had to do without domestic workers. And from everything I've read, Amita, people are now being, uh, are, are middle-class people are described as, as distraught. Uh, 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 middle-class women are described as just being sort of overwhelmed with the uh, amount of labor they now have to do. Can you share your observations um, about this with us? Uh, Raka, it's really your work that alerted me this, uh, to this is something to look out for. And uh, I've been quite intrigued by the range of expectations that people have had of this period. Uh, many thinking it's going to lead to some sort of a revolutionary renegotiation of the conjugal relationship. Um, others pointing out that uh, all these pictures of uh, men taking selfies of themselves proudly brandishing a broom uh, are just a sort of temporary uh, celebration of the fact uh, which is extraordinary that men are doing something that is uh, culturally considered to be women's work. 
and that this is all passing, that uh, women's work has been invisible and underpaid all of these years. Um, it is one uh, not going to lead to a transformation once this lockdown is over. And uh, the reason why this uh, question, which has been the elephant in the drawing room of the modern middle class, which is about the double burden of work that women, uh, women, who, women bear, is again going to be deferred. Because once domestic workers come back into the equation, um, then one can go on pretending that the nuclear household is about men, uh, about the conjugal bond between husbands and wives. Uh, whereas in the conventional families that we're talking about in middle-class India, uh, it's always a marriage of three. There's always the husband and the wife and the domestic worker. So uh, despite what uh, does seem to be happening temporarily, uh, I have a feeling that it's not a major transformation. Uh, but your work really, in a way, also leads us uh, not only into the middle class kitchen and the middle class bathroom, uh, but also into the lives and homes of domestic workers themselves. So um, I think that I, that notion of what this pandemic has meant to the home um, should also lead us to think about what is happening in the uh, space of the working class home. Should I? Yeah, actually, yeah, you know, actually I wanted I, to. I wanted to first ask you something. One more question uh, about the middle class home. I think it's very important for us to move to the question of the lives of those who work in those homes, which we will in a second. But is it your sense, in fact, you know, th there was an article uh, just describing, uh, I think, the U.S. An article that basically said that uh, I just read that said nearly half of the men say they do most of the homeschooling during this period, but only 3% of women agree. So, right? so I wanted to get a sense of, is it your sense that um, men really are stepping in or is it just around the fr fringes still? I think it's very much around the fringes. Um, and you know, it's the tasks of, for instance, going out and buying the groceries that uh, again are the kind that men have predominantly taken up. Uh, and what that does is simply reiterate that division between the home and the domestic uh, sphere and the, uh, the world outside, which is still a world for men to negotiate. So um, even with a lot of professional couples who might both be working from home, sitting in front of their laptops or whatever, uh, if you look at who's going out to do the grocery shopping, it's still men. Uh, who is doing the, um, the, the bulk of the cooking or the cleaning, uh, especially if the cleaning doesn't involve high-tech um, mm -hmm. equipment, as most Indian cleaning doesn't, uh, then it's still going to be uh, the women who take charge of those, uh, 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 of those activities, including child rearing. And I think it's also the case that um, for, for those who inhabit sort of multi-generational households or that have the in-laws living with them or who are living with the in-laws, I think the in-laws do not fully un see the, their daughter-in-law's job, even if she is working usually outside the home, whether she's in the IT sector or, any, you know, or, or, or doing any sort of other work as a legitimate, um, full, you know, fully functional, legitimate work. And so you know, professional women are having to stop their work, go make their in-law snacks and come back you know, during their, to manage their work day, because, because I think that, that's, that, is, uh, that is actually what gets at what you were saying, that this is likely not to actually be a turning point, because women's work outside the home is still not seen as, as legitimate as men's work outside the home. Well, a number um, of women have actually commented at, at that, that, you know, uh, it's, it would have been something that they could uh, actually discuss and work out differently with their partners if it weren't for parents in the household because it's often the uh, older generation that expects certain gender norms to be maintained um, and uh, it's, it's also true that there's a lot of care work around elderly people which sometimes also falls on the women because that the expectation is that they're the ones who are going to be doing it. 
So if these women are doing these, this work, this extra work temporarily, and it was gonna go back to uh, the paid domestic workers when they come back, um, let's move in fact to talk about these workers and their homes and shift the focus from the middle class homes to the homes of the, of, of the very people who do this work for the middle classes. Um, and paint a picture, if you will, um, of the homes in which they live. Most of them are no longer live-ins, which live in domestic workers, which means they live in um, um, slums and, and um, squatter settlements, right? I think, Raka, the first thing was just the uh, shock of the lockdown that in one, not even one day, not even 24 hours, four hours notice was given that there would be a 21 day lockdown starting from uh, March 25th. Um, so people had no chance to figure out what they wanted to do. And uh, the 21 day lockdown is now extended. We're now on today's the 56th day and uh, there is no end in sight. So uh, what happened immediately was that there was panic uh, both in the middle class households, which said, oh, you know, we need to uh, make sure that workers don't come in. Uh, and of course, the irony was that workers, domestic workers were thought of as a source, uh, you know, as carriers of contagion. Whereas in India, in fact, it's well to do people who travel abroad who have brought COVID-19 back with them. And uh, if anybody is at risk, it's the domestic workers because uh, they can't maintain the kind of social distancing norms have been told to follow. They can't wash their hands. Um, and, and there's a whole set of things that they just simply can't do, nor do they have uh, the money or the social security to be able to afford decent health care. So um, there's this sort of catastrophic announcement uh, that has um, affected working class households, where often it's the women who go out to work um, in homes doing chores, Whereas men could be construction workers, rickshaw pullers, um, some of them factory workers, and so on. And for all that the government sort of piously told people that they must pay workers, uh, in fact, workers haven't been paid. Um, so are you talking about the government suggesting and other people suggesting that even though the domestic workers aren't coming to your house, you should go ahead and pay them? That's right. And the government also said the same thing for workers. Uh, say, you know, on construction sites, uh, in factories, and so on. So uh, for a lot of people who are self-employed, street vendors, uh, small shopkeepers, um, um, you know, self-employed masons, and so on, uh, of course, there's no chance of being paid by others. But uh, for those people who were working on more or less steady projects, or who were salaried, like domestic workers, um, in fact, that, um, that, advice from the government hasn't actually been, um, you know, been, been forthcoming. So people have not been paid. So, but I have heard that, I guess I've heard discussion in various uh, residential societies, you know, about sort of, it's not considered a worker's right. It's considered sort of, do you, you know, as a morally good person, should I keep paying my domestic worker? Right. And because there are no sets of because this is the informal economy and there are no sets of rules, we, it falls upon not an issue, it becomes not an issue of rights, but an issue of the, the magnanimity of, of the of the middle class employer. Yeah, absolutely. And I think to a certain extent, there's a certain amount of self-interest also in, uh, involved, not just in the feeling of being benevolent. Uh, but also that, uh, you know, there's a sort of intimate relationship between employer and employee in the case of domestic work, uh, which means that um, getting someone who understands the ways of your household, who behaves according to what you consider uh, right, um, you know, becomes something that's actually, uh, people say, worth more than money. So um, people are reluctant to lose a worker even though there are you know, thousands of women who are actually available and who are desperate to do that kind of work, uh, but people are reluctant to, to lose a person they have become familiar with 
and who's familiar in their particular household uh, routines. So I think giving money in some cases is a way of maintaining that relationship. Um, but you're absolutely right. I think the idea also is that you're uh, uh, obliging them and that they will acknowledge that debt by coming back and uh, working for you. So um, buying their loyalty. Yes, but, but I think in the majority of cases, uh, middle-class households have paid workers only a small fraction of what they are owed, you know, half wages, um, or, or in some cases, none at all. I've been talking to not just domestic workers, but, um, you know, chauffeurs in, in, the, in the area where I live. Um, they're having to negotiate and beg for uh, lost wages. And uh, when I said, but don't your employers understand that you also have to keep your household running? They said, no, the employer says, well, you know, my business, my shop is closed or um, my firm's cutting down on people. So, you know, I'm having to be careful about money too. So yeah. many of these people then, I, I, I have read um, sort of this, the ironic situation of those who prepare food for the middle classes are now depending on NGOs to provide them, uh, them food. Um, but many have joined, right, the, 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 the migration treks um, outside, out of the big cities, right? The, the, these treks that I have now come, come to call the, the big disaster. What was the government thinking with these lockdown announcements with so little notice and the suspension of public transportation? I think this government just didn't have a clue. I think they did not know uh, that there were quite so many people who would be left, uh, left stranded. Uh, because this is, the, in, think about the sheer enormity of it. 93% of India's workforce, as you know, works in the informal sector. Um, a lot of these people are migrant workers. Uh, and they and earn daily wages. They earn daily wages. A lot of them are not, um, you know, don't actually have, especially migrant workers, don't have access to, um, you know, the, the subsidized uh, food provisions that the government might provide. They don't have access to other kinds of social security payments. Many of them indeed only manage to stay afloat uh, because they are maintaining this sort of precarious balance between a rural economy where they go in the monsoons and they help with the farming and uh, an urban one where they find work wherever they can. And um, what this uh, extraordinary announcement has done is, um, you know, show the rest of the country at least that's paying attention, um, the sheer magnitude of the, this, you know, this cat catastrophe that has uh, affected quite so many people. And the government, even after all these accounts are out there, that, you know, that, that great exodus that, uh, that you mentioned, uh, still seems to be quite uh, blind and quite deaf. For, so for instance, you know, just think about the fact that the Indian railways um, on an average day run about 20,000 trains. Uh, now in lockdown, they're running a few hundreds just um, recently in the last couple of weeks in order to allow a trickle of workers to travel to their homes. And you know the, this complete loss of employment in the urban industrial sector for workers has meant that this kind of tightrope that they were walking, um, some agricultural work, some wage labor here, uh, women working in um, middle-class homes and so on. Um, this tightrope has suddenly gone slack and they're in free fall. And um, the safety nets that the welfare state is meant to provide don't it really exist for them. It's the family that's their safety net. And that's why they're headed at home because, you know, in, a, in, in such, such dire times, uh, that's the only place where you can find some shelter, some sense of security, just some sense that someone cares for you. You know, the, the government has, um, has launched Operation Bande Mataram to bring workers back from abroad. Right, but they're obviously not doing the same thing for for uh, the, the migrant workers, the people who 
the middle classes rely on every day of their lives, those who clean their bathrooms, those who build their roads, those who sell them vegetables. Some people call this callousness or apathy, but I think it goes far beyond it, right? It's not just callousness or apathy. It's, it's, it's something that you referred to this when you were talking about the migrant bodies as, as being uh, contagious in some sense. So I think it's something that goes to the ways in which middle-class India lives its life based on the labor and existence of these, um, of these other sorts of classes. Um, I, I think that it, it sort of gets us back to, uh, but I think about, uh, again, back to my book for a second, um, the ways in which what we call now social distancing is not actually social distancing. We're actually spatial distancing, right? And trying to keep social distance at a minimum, we're trying to keep social closeness while spatial distancing, though we call this social distancing. What really happens in middle-class households is social distancing, right? What happens in middle-class households is uh, despite spatial intimacy, uh, social distancing, what you call the domestic worker where you allow them to sit what they drink from, where they put their bodies, right? These are bodies that we utterly need, the, the middle class utterly needs in order to do the daily existence. But these are the very bodies that are considered impure and polluted and, and having the potential to bring us uh, disease and illness, right? How do we understand this relationship between those who the middle class really needs and the way in which we also think about them as being carriers of, um, of, of, of dirt. Yeah, um, essential yet expendable, um, you know, intimate and yet always other. I mean, it's a series of contradictions that um, come to mind when we think about the way in which caste and the idea of purity and pollution is so deeply ingrained in the Indian middle class and other and wider uh, DNA, and um, you know I think of all the sorts of uh, polluting tasks which carry the most sense of risk and danger. Um, they're all to do with bodily waste, be it um, you know your excreta, be it uh, be it menstrual blood that, you know, gets onto clothes, be it just the dead body itself. And uh, everyone who performs these tasks of dealing with, you know, hair that's been cut or blood or dead bodies, et cetera, or, or uh, of, um, you know, feces um, is treated as if they themselves are polluting um, because we have deemed certain certain matter to be polluting yeah. and then, the, then uh, in a curious reversal these people themselves the Dalits are then thought of as polluting uh, upper caste so uh, I think this idea of um, both intimate and yet um, always to be pushed away is perhaps responsible as much as the huge economic inequality that you know we we live with uh, for the idea that um, it doesn't matter if uh, people live um, and die on the streets, walking thousands of kilometers through um, temperatures above 40 degrees Celsius day after day to get home, carrying their children, um, you know, on their backs and pulling along their little one suitcase of worldly possessions. So I think that it's a coming together of caste and class, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. kind of cruelty and callousness that we're looking at. There's a sense that these people don't matter. And if they were to just disappear, well, we're a large country. You know, what does it matter if 10% of the population dies? But Amita, I think we're also saying that it's something more than the callousness about 10% of the population, and, and if 10% of the population dies. You know, if these bodies are considered polluting, these bodies are dangerous. What we're, we're not only saying, as you just said, that the, the, the main subjects of the Indian nation really are the middle class and they are to be protected, right? They are to be protected above all. And, and even if 
it is their waste that is being expelled and being carried you know by these uh, by these other classes uh, their roads that are being built it is it is it is the body of the middle class that must be um, maintained uh, and and this sort of brings up the notion that I, I that I've always loved that uh, Judith Butler and Anne McClintock and others use the, the, the notion of 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 abjection when you really need something, but you need uh, like these certain sort of functions, but in order to constitute yourself, you must expel it. And you must therefore expel also those that are connected to it, right? So these abject, the domestic worker and the migrants really are the abject others of the Indian nation. They are the ones whom we need, but we must also, um, uh, expel in order to be who we are, you know, middle class carriers of the Indian nation. So I think that in order for us, and here I'm going to say us because I was once a middle class Indian, you know, um, that, that in order to preserve who we are, in order to preserve who the middle class is, we have to deny the humanity of those who do this work in order to preserve ourselves. And so I think it's beyond callousness. I think it's constitutive of the Indian middle class. I agree, Raka. And uh, well, both of us have talked so much about the cultural politics of, of the middle class and how exclusion and yet, you know, there's still some somewhere hankering after the idea of inclusion too, that, you know, it should all be, you know, what if people were all like us? Um, but this feeling, uh, which I think is, uh, is a somewhat wistful one, even people who in their everyday yeah. practices will actually defend um, inequalities uh, is in some ways, I think a source of hope. But, you know, it has, that hope has a long way to go because a number of my friends who uh, haven't been born or who haven't lived in India for a long time uh, growing up, uh, said that when they came to India, the first thing that struck them was how the middle class treated domestic workers or treated, in fact, anybody yeah. else who was working class. The social distance, the tone of voice you use, um, the way you will not look them in the eye, the way you will treat them as if they're, uh, they're anonymous. Um, that kind of social distance where you won't, uh, where they can't, you know, use the bathroom or they can't sit at the same table at, as you. That so they're is- noticing. So, you know, we have only a couple of minutes left and um, there are a couple of questions, Amita, and I want to just take up one of them um, because I think that you're, you are leading us to a point of, of, of some hope perhaps. Um, and the questions are really not twofold, one is, is it possible that there will be a response from domestic workers who after this situation will be unwilling to work or will push for to negotiate their salaries now that their value is more, more evident in their absence in some sense? Um, yeah, so, so what about that? Well, I, I, I know that, uh, that organizers who are working with domestic workers are, uh, are hoping that this will be in some way a transformative moment. Uh, but I think that has to be juxtaposed with the fact that uh, there are just going to be that many more people, especially women, desperate to find work because the rest of the economy isn't going to start anytime soon. And if women are going to be uh -huh. the sole breadwinners in their households, they're going to be able you know, accepting whatever terms that they can get. And um, I, I hope women can, you know, fight to get a fairer wage, to get more decent work conditions, to be just treated with a little bit of respect. Uh, but I think that fight just got a lot tougher um, because of the widespread distress that the pandemic has caused. And I think the last question, if we can answer it very quickly is, could some of the pushback come back, come from the middle class women who are now bearing the burden and will the pushback come? So they, they can go two ways, these middle class women, they can either say, thank God you're back, now take all, do all the work. Or they can say, I now realize how much work this is and I'm not going to be the one 
who is always responsible. I insist that the, 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 um, this labor be shared and I insist that we treat the domestic better. What are the chances of that? Yeah, I think some solidarity and sisterhood would be great. I so hope that that happens. Um, but, you know, when I look at these deep, the deep gulfs with which we live, um, I think we just have to fight to make that solidarity happen. Uh, and it's a tough, tough struggle. One thing we do know is that this pandemic, like other critical events, has really laid bare the bones of our society um, and the ways in which these inequalities uh, exist in a way that we were, it was easier to paper over without the crisis. And um, it's that, that, that paper was thin and it's torn now. And the question is, um, are things going to go back exactly the way they were and worse, or are they going to create little pockets of solidarity? So that is, I guess, our hope. And with that, uh, we've come to the end of our short conversation. Thank you so much, Amita. It's always such a great pleasure to talk to you. Um, thank you everybody for participating. I wish I knew who you were and I wish I could see you, but I'm so glad that you were able to be part of our conversation. Thank you so much. Thanks, Bye. Bye.